we move into a new hurricane season, many persons are obviously concerned, and for good reason, and concerned about the well-being of, yes, maybe their personal possessions, but specifically the well-being of themselves as well as their family and loved ones. But as we now move into a new hurricane season, what is being done to help prepare the individuals emotionally, especially those that may have been affected last year? This evening I have two interesting individuals, and I'll use that in a positive way, please, <laughs> sitting with me. And the work that you've been doing that I've come to understand has been brilliant. And I'll let you tell our viewers a little bit about yourselves, but Catherine Bolin, as well as Dr. Peter Weller. And welcome, please, to the, the set of Healthy Perspectives. Yeah. But first I'll ask, what has brought you to Antigua and Barbuda? Well, I guess our work with UN Women as consultants in the region has brought us um, because of, I guess, the competences we have in helping to assess and design interventions around psychosocial programs. In other words, how to help people cope with stress. And I think I, you know, I'll say from the beginning that that word psychosocial has become something that we maybe we can talk some more about as well, we go along. And if you don't mind me yeah, calling you cat certainly. on, on please, camera. Please, please. <laughs> if let's go down mm. that road then, why is there this this fear? Is there something associated with the word that you're finding people dislike? Well, I tell you, you know, for those of us who work in the field, it comes naturally. Psychosocial, to do with the mind, to do with society, relationships, etc. But what we've realized is that some people hear psychosocial and hear psycho mm -hmm. as in crazy, mad, mental illness. Understood. And therefore, there's a challenge in trying to engage them to even accept that maybe they have issues or concerns that might warrant some kind of intervention. I think part of the problem is that there's been a pathologizing of mental health so that people think of it only in terms of psychotic illnesses and psychiatric hospitals. Um, and one of the things that we've been trying to advocate for and in certain cases facilitate is discussions around, you know, this is really just how the mind works when we are stressed and overwhelmed. It affects us in certain ways, anxiety, depression, concentration, interpersonally. And that it's normal, it's natural, it's a normal response to an abnormal situation and therefore there are ways you can cope. And the earlier you cope, the better it is for you. So when you take the word psychosocial, mm -hmm. break it apart for me. What are the meanings? Well, psychosocial is you know made up of the, uh, the concepts around psychology and the way the mind works mm -hmm. and how human behavior is motivated and managed and coordinated. And the social part, of course, is speaking to relationships, the society, community, interpersonal skills, needs for affiliation, affection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, the hurricanes, the disasters in the region, have certainly affected all of us in terms of our minds, how we think, or our anxiety, or inability to concentrate. Sometimes, worrying, getting depressed, sad, grieving, mourning—all of that is part of the psychology part of it. And the social part of it, of course, is how it has affected our relationships. Mm -hmm. I mean, from the level of if you're stressed, you're going to be more anxious, more irritated, you might be more aggressive, you might have more arguments, more conflict. And that's kind of where the gender and gender-based violence comes in, because, of course, men and women respond differently to stress sometimes. And then, of course, it's how society pulls together to respond so in terms of social skills to a disaster. We've seen it across the region and certainly here in Antigua and Barbuda. People have come together to work together, but at the same time, they're suffering from a level of stress, stress that is mitigating against what should be really a unified approach. And um, I was going to ask you that yeah. question. What are you seeing as a, a psychosocial consultant mm -hmm. being here in Antigua and the other territories that you may operate? What are some of the things you're seeing or witnessing? Right, and one of the things that we're looking at in that spectrum of psychosocial support services. So now I'm not just looking at what is psychosocial, but what are the psychosocial support services and reframing that in a wellness frame. We're looking at the services that people are providing by faith-based organizations, mm -hmm. relationships, community organizations. We're looking at the services such as guidance counselors are providing to students. 
such as all these organizations that are playing the different role in these pieces that feed up to across the spectrum of support. So all the way up, of course, to the clinical, the need for psychosocial support services for clinically um, diagnosed mental health issues that need to be addressed. So we're looking at that spectrum of wellness. And so being here, and one of the things that's my greatest pleasure of doing this work, um, and such a pleasure to be here with Peter and also with you and women, is hearing the stories about the people who are making an impact. And mm -hmm. so we've had the true pleasure of meeting with organizations that are working across all of those different pieces to fit into that spectrum of support services. So not just looking at that psycho mental health component, which is very important, but also where those supports are really important for all of us. Stress relieving, normalized responses to trauma that we all, that we all have in our lives. And so how we can actually support on all stages, each other and the community as a whole. And I like the fact that you use the word wellness, because when I hear wellness, I'm not thinking just the yeah. in, that incident. I'm thinking prevention, mm -hmm. what long-term things will be put in place to support right. individuals for whatever crises they may encounter. And you bring up a really good point that I think we hear, we've heard a lot in the last few months and we hear in our professional lives outside of this is that wellness and psychosocial needs, your wellness, my wellness goes up and down day yeah. to day. Some days I feel better than if I've slept more than the day before, They week to week, month to month, year to year. And so looking at it not that this happened and now I'm a totally different person, but looking at it that here I am and it's a spectrum and I'll go up and I'll go down and there's resources that I have, resiliencies I have that I can build on and there's also resources in my community that I may know or I may have a friend that know about. Yeah. Yeah, and I think what I, I take a step back and say, what does wellness mean? Yes. Right. Because I think part of what you were alluding to is, um, well, I, I was thinking of when you made your comment. <laughs> was that, you know, we tend to think of mental health as psychological and emotional. Mm -hmm. But wellness broadens the spectrum. Exactly. So wellness is the physical, it is the psychological, it's the cognitive, the way you think, it's the spiritual, your faith and spirituality and religion, it's the intellectual, are you stimulated, it's the professional, what's happening in your occupation, it's the environmental in terms of the green environment, the built environment, mm -hmm. your community. And when we present it that way, then it is about keeping your life in balance. And you may be less well in one area, but you're okay in another area. And I think what we have to work towards is ensuring that people see, therefore, their mental health as only part of their wellness wheel, and that they are willing to seek services in the same way that they would if they had a toothache, or they sprained their ankle, or they were having a problem at work and they're going to go to HR. Mm -hmm. you get help. And as Kat was saying, that help can be provided by many people in the society. It's, it's not only the psychiatrist and the psychologist, the guidance counselor, the pastor, the imam, your friend, the counselor, the, the counselor at work, the HR person. And I think if we can broaden the perspective to make a difference, it's particularly necessary now because as you said at the opening, mm -hmm. we're in a new hurricane season mm -hmm. and a lot of people who were stressed from last year's events have not fully dealt with because they've actually suppressed in order to cope. Their survival brain has gone into high gear and they're doing everything they need to do. But all the memories, all the things are now being Still triggered. There. And it's mm -hmm. particularly, I think, important to think about the children who don't necessarily have the language skills to ask for or explain mm -hmm. what they're feeling, but are going to begin to feel that triggering of the trauma and the stress and the anxiety. And I think our parents and our teachers need to be particularly aware that when they see a child misbehaving, it may be a symptom of anxiety and it needs mm -hmm. to be addressed differently. It's not about punishing them. It's not about corporal yeah. punishment or discipline. It's about talking, listening, hearing the views. Now, catch the child life special. Well, and, and I'm, I get it. I'm it's, glad you yeah, went that road. Stress responses are huge. Yeah. I was going to ask, what should they be looking for? What are right. the parents looking for? What right. are the teachers looking for? What are the other, the grandparents? Great question. And you brought up one really big one that we look at is misbehaving. And so what is behind that behavior? Sometimes we don't have the time or energy as an adult. We have many things sometimes that are going on. And so if we just say they're misbehaving and reprimand the same way as we would 
maybe in a different situation, we're not really getting to the root at what that behavior was triggering. But other stress response are regression. So a, a child who mm. might not have wet the bed for years um, may wet the bed. Children who um, haven't been biting nails or have done something, they might be fighting, um, they might be crying out at night or having nightmares, um, running away, doing different behaviors or um, avoidant of coping. And so if you see children that are used to be talking a lot and then now as the hurricane season has started, have stopped talking or reaching or out withdrawn. or withdrawn and a storm comes or just rain, normal, if rains come and you see that there's a, a withdrawal in that child either in your classroom or in your home, those are things that you want to definitely, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and so Kat's been talking about the children and mm -hmm. the younger children, of course, who are less verbal, are, you, mm -hmm. know, you have to be more careful with. But then you have adolescents who are then going through their mm -hmm. normal hormonal turmoil, their normal need to assert themselves and, you know, be independent. And they're also dealing with all of these changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether because they were traumatized by the actual hurricane or maybe the dislocation of having to leave their home or the economic impact, parents not making as much money, mm -hmm. whatever it is, those all come together and you can get a lot of what would seem like delinquent behavior, but really is because of stress and anxiety. And it's not just a bad boy or a bad girl. Um, maybe if somebody were to help them to express what was going on, they may mm -hmm. realize that they're having a post-traumatic response. And I guess I would just like to say also that, you know, we talk a lot about post-traumatic stress disorder, which of course is a diagnosis, a syndrome that requires a, a, a grouping of symptoms. But in fact, most people don't have a full disorder, but they'll have evidence, they'll have mm -hmm. um, dimensions of it. They might have the nightmares, they might have the flashbacks, or they might have the anxiety. But they're all post-traumatic. Mm -hmm. And I think part of what we need to do is normalize it and say, you know, that's, that's a normal response that's okay. to a mm -hmm. normal situation. Let's see how we can help you. You've mm -hmm. identified, both of you, some of the things that you need to look for, in, mm -hmm. specifically in children. Okay, so you look for it, you identify it, you, you see it. What do they do? Where do they go from there if a, if a parent mm -hmm. sees this in the child? Right. I think that's a really good question. And the key thing that is to reach out to the resources you know. And then from there, ask. Start the conversation. I think so often when I feel overwhelmed, and as a human, if you feel overwhelmed, sometimes you just shut down mm -hmm. and you ignore it. And so being aware of these symptoms is, or these reactions and being aware that it's natural, that this is a response of the brain, a fight or flight response. This is a normal reaction. Being aware of it is step one. And step two is starting somewhere. And so there, there's no wrong answer. So start somewhere. If your child's in school and you know that a safe person for your child might be the guidance counselor or their teacher, go to them. If you have a great relationship with someone in your church and you're very um, engaged in your church community, go to them. Reach out to the community that you feel comfortable with and then begin there. And start that conversation somewhere, I think, is the easiest next step. And from there, then continue to seek out opportunities for additional support. But recognizing... we got to talk about it. And we got to talk about it. we got to recognize ourselves, where we stand in it, where our children, where our families, where our loved ones. If you see a loved one that or a friend, um, open that conversation up. And then wherever you feel safe, start that conversation outwardly too. And so it brings us back, of course, to the stigmatization of that topic. <laughs> mm. And I think that's why it's so important because the conversation doesn't start very often because people feel that they're going to be demonstrating some kind of weakness, some kind of dysfunction mm -hmm. to say that they're being affected. And I, I think there are two points I want to make there. You know, we've heard a lot. We've heard a lot from people who, who have acknowledged that sometimes they feel that to admit that they are stressed and they're worried and they're anxious brings to them a feeling that they are not acknowledging their faith, mm -hmm. that it's a spiritual flaw to acknowledge that they're stressed. And I think that it's something that we really need to challenge yeah. because stress is a physiological reaction. It's not about your faith belief. You've been traumatized and you need to seek help. Your pastor or religious leader may be the person to help you, but the point is you need to start doing something about it because it has a multiplier effect. If daddy is stressed and he starts bringing the stress home, it's going to affect mom, it's going to affect the kids and all across the family spectrum. 
Early on in the conversation, mm -hmm. you both mentioned, well, I think it was you, Kat, mentioned you and women, mm -hmm. and then there was the gender affairs. Mm -hmm. Why are we saying that there is a, a gender difference in, in this response? Are, are men responding differently than women through whether it be the hurricane. That's an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> we as men, are, we are programmed to be the provider, the protector. We're supposed to be strong. We're supposed to be all these things. So when you're traumatized by a hurricane, when you've lost your job and your roof, and you cannot be the provider, you cannot be the protector, you're not able to earn the money, um, you're, you're anxious and worried, you have a certain type of reaction. Um, and depending on your personality, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, your behavior could go in a number of different directions. Um, so yes, there's a gender difference. You know, you're more likely um, to see some men drink um, as part of their coping, and for some of those men, it may become pro problematic. So I'm not saying drinking is necessarily problematic, but if you have a genetic predisposition or mm. some kind of history, that could push you in that direction. Mm -hmm. Aggressive behavior, etc. And you talked about adolescents earlier, mm. adolescent males who are now feeling like they have to prove their masculinity. That can also lead to a lot of delinquent behaviors. And on the side of women, of course, there's the, the again, stereotype of the woman as the one who's taking care of the home and the children. So if there's a trauma and problem, they're going to have their kinds of stress. Mm. So there's a gendered lens through which we have to look at things. And I think that it's important that we kind of promote that, not to say that any one person or group has more needs than the other, mm -hmm. but to ensure that we target our interventions to be as effective as possible. So I think you made some really great points there. And another thing that we've seen here specifically in Antigua and Barbuda is that a lot of the women and children in the past, and of course this is not across the board, but right. that we've heard and in meeting with shelter managers and different organizations that a lot of the women have stayed here in Antigua with children throughout the school year and so up until around now and whereas the men have returned home more so than some of the women to who Barbuda. have stayed here to Barbuda and so that even separation of the family is something else to consider and that the gender roles of course but one of just the roles we play in our family and that might be because you are the woman of the man but however your family decides to structure it there have been changes after the hurricane to what people need to change, what need to step up, what need to let go of. And so that's something specifically here that we've seen a lot of the men have gone back to Barbuda earlier right. than some of the women who are here. And with the homecoming, I believe July 1st is a lot more people will be turning back. But yeah. It sounds like based on what you're saying, parents and older ones really need to pay attention to the children and what they what they're going through and encourage them to talk about it. But the same principle applies to the adults, mm -hmm. that they need to talk about it and not to be ashamed to talk about it. But you were talking about the, the dads. What kind of response are you getting? Are the, the daddies talking about it, the, the, the problems, or let me put it this way, their feelings? Are they talking about their feelings? You know, we've, well... We've had a challenge in trying to get the men into some of our fora. Mm -hmm. And I think that that in itself is, is an important issue that I think we need to take the work to the men. We need to do more outreach to where men are, whether in their athletic clubs or their social clubs or wherever they, on the corner, mm -hmm. under the tree. You know, elsewhere in the world, um, a lot of the work that is done to engage men uses models that go to where men are, ask them what their concerns are, and then elicit and engage in a, what I call a conversation with consequences. Yeah. Not just chatting, but for a purpose. Mm. And I think we need to do more of that, because what we have found is that when you do get men talking, they will talk about their feelings. Mm -hmm. They will share their concerns, and you can then help them to problem solve and brainstorm. But, you know, again, it's a kind of vicious cycle, because... If we expect people to come to us as professionals and our offices are in the psychiatric hospital or somewhere, then the stigma works against us right. and we can't break the cycle. Mm -hmm. But if we do the outreach, engage with them and try to do more collaboration, I think we'll have far more success and we certainly need to have some success in this regard. So where do, you, where do we go from here now? We're a couple of weeks into hurricane season now. They are, hopefully nothing's on the, on the horizon, mm -hmm. but 
you're doing things now. How are you helping to build capacity within the our cultures now in, in raising the raising awareness? So it's not just building the capacity, but doing shows like this also raising the awareness. Right. Where do you see yourselves going from here? Mm. Well, I start with a couple of the things. I think one of the um, well, first of all, we have to understand that it is about influencing our culture, mm -hmm. and media mm -hmm. is very important, and social media is very powerful now. So it's how to craft and design targeted messages that are used in social media and have a kind of multiplier effect and scope. And I think that we've tried to initiate some small initiatives, but I think that's a that's a direction that needs to be to be taken. But more specifically, you know, one of the interventions we were involved with, and I mean, all of this is collaborative with of course. people mm -hmm. in Antigua and Barbuda and in TCI mm -hmm. and elsewhere. Working with the Red Cross in a training that we did to train up people to use psychological first aid principles. It became clear to us that a lot of the people who are doing that kind of work are very fragmented. They themselves don't have a support network. So one example of trying to sustain this kind of change process was that we were happy that the Red Cross agreed to host a regular forum that would bring together people doing psychosocial interventions to share best practices, to, to build capacity, mm -hmm. to inform and design and seek funding for new interventions. And that's the kind of sustainable change that we think can make a difference. Um, you know, we can do all the training and the sensitizing, but under stress, people regress, mm -hmm. of course. and when they don't have rewards and reinforcements <laughs> and support for what they're doing, it's easy to lose the new behaviors. Mm -hmm. so, Not the psychologist coming out of you. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but. I can't have it, yeah. The jargon is <laughs> every once in a while. But I think that that is that mm -hmm. is to me part of it. Trying to see how we can build networks and build processes that can sustain sustain a change. And structuring those with an open door policy. So like we talked about at the beginning where wellness is a spectrum and psychosocial support services are a spectrum of needs but also a spectrum of service providers and a spectrum of um, individuals and organizations that do work in different areas but they are all players at the same table. And so an open door policy where it's you don't have to meet a certain criteria to be allowed into this room to be a part of this forum, to be a part of this discussion. But anyone that is working within that psychosocial support service spectrum of care, agencies, government agencies, international agencies, anyone can come to the forum to continue the conversation, to seek peer support, to have people come to the table and say, this is what my organization is doing. What are you doing? Oh, where can we find a part partnership here. And when people are looking for fun, when there's an open door policy, I no. guess is what I'm trying to say. There's not closing And a to free different... flow of communication. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, yeah. because part of the challenge is that we're all seeing things in our spheres of influence. But when we don't share them, nobody's yeah. seeing the whole elephant. Everybody's seeing part of it. And then the programs are not targeted and not mm -hmm. going to be effective. And of course, therefore, the other part of sustainable change is about trying to ensure that all the stakeholders, the donor agencies, the funding agencies, the governmental agencies also are on the same page and have a coordinated mm -hmm. and collaborative approach. Approach. The danger is that well-intentioned interventions end up being scattershot. They're mm -hmm. doing a thing here and a thing here and a thing here. Nobody's looking at how to make them synergize, how to facilitate behavior change. And I'll put on my psychology <laughs> again and tell you that I cringe sometimes when I see the work that is being done by people. And I mean, well-intentioned, working Understood. hard, mm -hmm. and it's not going to have the effect because it's not targeted to the cognitive, developmental, whatever stage of the target audience. And it's happening at the same time that somebody else is doing something else over here and something mm -hmm. else over here. And if they could only just get their ducks in a row, we could move forward. Mm -hmm. But we have to advocate for that. Yeah. We meaning we in the country, we as stakeholders. Um, so and seek each other out and find yeah. out. One of the things we started with this project with UN Women, um, when we started by asking those questions, and we're here for our first week not providing trainings or mentorship or capacity building, but just sitting at the table with some of these key players who are here. And so recognizing, I think, that that's your, your role if you don't live um, in that community, but even if you do, that that is your heart, part of your role as an advocate and as a stakeholder in any position. But especially, I think, and I'm biased, so <laughs> I'll just go ahead, in psychosocial support services, because not only 
I think looping back to that, not only are we doing, we as professionals, um, doing everything you can to support others, but you need support yourself. Yeah. And so if nothing else, if you are siloed, and I've done it and I do it to myself all the time, if you silo yourself because there's too many jobs to be done, then it's harder to get the support you need to be inspired to continue to sit at that table and provide services for others. And I think this project and other work that we do, one of the things that inspires me the most is hearing the stories of the amazing individuals that are doing so much every day to support people. And often people don't know about it. And so coming together in forums like this, and not saying that we have the answers, we certainly don't, no. but this is one way you um, have to, start. to begin. You have to start. And having the conversation starts. With uh, starts consequences. The, yeah. With consequences, <laughs> I'll remember that. Yeah. Thank you both yeah. so very much. And I started off by saying interesting, and I really meant that this was enlightening, but also therapeutic <laughs> as well, <laughs> to have the conversation with you. And hopefully in the days, weeks, months, years to come, because we're talking long term, mm -hmm. we'll be able to have further discussions, but because we'd be really curious to see where you've gone from here. And if we can be of support on behalf of the American University of Antigua, please oh. let us know. Yeah. Thank All you. pleasure. Yes, thank you for your time. Always, always.